Hi, I'm Gail. And hi, I'm Catherine. Welcome to Women Over 70, Aging Reimagined, our award-winning weekly podcast. But please visit womenover70.com and consider joining Aging Reimagined Circle, our sustaining membership fund, so we may continue to inspire women to age with curiosity, courage, and creativity. Members enjoy monthly programming and probing discussions. And today we're excited to have with us Liz Kitchens. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> yes, welcome to Women Over 70, Aging Reimagined. Liz Kitchens lives in Orlando, Florida, and is eagerly anticipating the publication of her new book on May 16th, Be Brave, Lose the Beige, Finding Your Sass After 60. <laughs> Before becoming an author, Liz was a clay artist. She liked to create pieces with a message. For 15 years, she directed a creative arts program for teens in underserved communities. And through this grant writing, her own creative process informed her what to do next. Liz conducts workshops and seminars on creativity. For 35 years, she was a market researcher and is the founder of What's Next Boomer a website dedicated to helping baby boomers navigate retirement options. And she is also the creator of the blog, Be Brave, Lose the Beige, which focuses on issues facing lady boomers. She's a contributing writer for the online magazine 60 and Me, and has been published in various online and print publications. Liz is married, the mother of three adult children, and has three grandchildren. We're so happy, Liz, to have you with us today. And when we spoke, you said something that really stuck with me. And that was, women have a biography as long as the veil on a wedding gown. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much, ladies, for inviting me on your show. I'm a big fan and have listened to your podcasts. And as I am turning 70 this year in July, this seems very appropriate. <laughs> um, yes, we did talk about that, Gail. Um, I, you know, I, I said that in one of my, I kind of threw that line out in one of my um, seminars that I do on creativity. And I, and I, I said it to, and of course, women are the, the, the main gender I, I focus on in, in my blog book and classes. And I said, look behind you, look right. I just, it was an exercise, write down all the things you have done in the course of your life. I mean, don't leave anything out. Um, when one woman, you know, kind of embarrassed said, uh, well, you know, I was a bartender working my way through college and I said, that, you know, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, the skills you learned from even a job like that. And so I, I, I said that it's just like, be proud of all of these, these skills you've gained over the years. We just don't take enough credit for it, I think. And so that was, that was somewhat one of the impetuses for writing this book that really focuses a lot on women's empowerment issues. Uh, maybe an overused expression, but still, nevertheless, women have to own their past so they can really live right now and present. And so I, I'm a big fan of that exercise. I mean, when I was writing my own bio for my book, I didn't know what to leave out. <laughs> and I, if I, you know, I'd love to interview the two of you. I just, I think we've done a lot of stuff in our lives. So oh, sure. that that's where that emerged from, and I'm I'm I I think that's that's kind of cool. You remembered me saying that. Thank you, Gail. You're welcome. I'm I'm interested in the, the title of your book that's coming out very soon, especially the uh, "Lose the Beige" and finding your sass. What tell us more about that? Well, in 2009, I start I, I well. Well, part, as part of your introduction, you mentioned I was a clay artist. I'm really not that much anymore, but I uh, 
I, I did start a program in like right after 9-11. It was kind of a hopeful act to, um, and it was called the Jeremiah Project. And it was a clay, I was a clay lover, a potter, and I wanted to bring clay to underserved middle school age kids who, you know, often didn't get to go to really cool art programs and, you know, middle schoolers are kind of the underserved age category. So I started that. And just with the with the power of clay is, you know, even centering on the wheel and it's it's a way to center your lives and shaping a, a vessel out of clay is, is a metaphor for shaping your life. And so that that really got me into clay. And then I started describing the pieces and realized I was having way too much fun with the descriptions and decided that you know, messaging was something I wanted to do and started a blog, Be Brave, Lose the Beige in 2009. And blogs are just awesome. You choose podcasts as your method of expression. I did blogs and I just really loved it. And, you know, women my age were my target audience because that's what I know about (laughs) And just like women your age have probably been your audience and re- and listeners. Um, and so so the so I just creativity is kind of at the heart of my blog and my book. I I I laughingly call myself a creativity evangelist. I just believe in the power of creativity to transform lives. I saw it in my program for kids. I see it in the classes where I work with my lady boomers and in my own life. And it's not, you know, it sounds like my, when I tell men the name of my book or my blog, they say, is it, is it makeup? Is it fashion? (laughs) Like, no, you idiot. (laughs) It's, it's, it's it's a metaphor. (laughs) Um, you know, for living well, it's it's everything you tell your listeners. Um, but I use color to access tough issues. Um, and so I've talked about, you know, everything, you know, early on emptiness syndrome and boomerang kids and then, you know, navigating sex over 60. And uh, one of I had a blog that was called um uh, out of sight or out of si- or out of sight, and I, it was about a trip to New York I took with some other women my age and how invisible we were. And so I came home and said, you know, we've gone from being out out of sight as they called you know boomer girls in the '60s to literally being out of sight, mm-hmm. um, and what that feels like, um, and what we do with that. And so what was kind of a was it about way. the trip to New York that made that so apparent being invisible? Oh, good, good question. <laughs> we, you know, more than once on the busy streets, we were, I, I, you know, we were almost run over by, by professionals um, who were surprised we were even taking up real estate <laughs> on the sidewalks. Uh, that, that was, that was pretty shocking. Um Now, this is a little off, not off color, but a little scandalous. A a friend of mine said we could smoke a bong on Park on on Fifth Avenue and the police would just think other people were blowing blowing smoke in in our faces, that (laughs) we were just that invisible. And we laughed. I mean, it was so true. Um, so, So that prompted a few blog posts. I'm going to ask you to adjust your camera so we can see more of you, especially okay. if you are wearing color. And not oh, I am wearing color. <laughs> I do. I mean, I while I am crazy about color, um, the blog and the book are really, I mean, it's just a, it's a convenient way. I've kind of anthropomorphized the color beige, if you can call that a color, um, <laughs> and magenta. And they've I've set them up in kind of a life contest with each other. And magenta kind of taunts beige into like, oh, you won't break rules. You, you know, stay within conventional norms. And, um, you know, it's, in fact, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll read you the I call it an ode to beige and it introduces the book. 
Um, meet beige. Beige is reliable, practical, sensible, and safe. Beige doesn't put up a fuss. It is very accommodating and goes with everything. Beige is conflict averse, follows the rules, blends in, and avoids standing out. Now meet Magenta. Magenta and her sister Jewel Tones are rich, dynamic, loud, sometimes garish, and not easily overlooked. Magenta doesn't always mix well with others. Magenta is hard to ignore. Beige is endorsed, even encouraged by our society. Governing bodies for further citizens in beige. Too many screaming magentas and shrieking yellows and there's trouble in River City. Or so we're told. But maybe some rebellion is warranted at this stage in our lives. The biggest danger intrinsic to beige is that it precludes creative thinking. And I think creative thinking is a, is a pretty good accomplice in our aging journey. <laughs> so that, that's kind of at the heart um, of the messaging of the book and the blog. I love it. I just love it. And, and, so, so, glad. <laughs> and so is, is, uh, so that's why you're wearing kind of a magenta color, right? <laughs> it is. My, it's my favorite color. It's a combination of red and I've actually analyzed the color. You know, it's red and purple. So there's um, red is just out there. Who doesn't just I, I see red roses behind you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't love the richness of that color? And if we can live richly, then that's the, that's the meaning of life. <laughs> and so the colors just serve me as a wonderful metaphor for the way we choose to live our lives. And it's not just about picking up a paintbrush and um, learning to, you know, in a very linear way, drawing um, with colored pencils or something. It's, you know, it's, it's ch making life choices. But the other thing I talk a lot about in my book is, you can't, uh, creativity isn't just like snap your fingers and summon creative creativity. There's a process. You have to exercise those creative muscles, many of which have atrophy, atrophied over the years, um, you know, since we were 10 and, you know, stop that frivolous stuff. And what comes from exercising your creativity is creative thinking. And that's, that's the heart of all of this. Creative thinking says, go ahead and break some rules. It's okay. <laughs> if not now, when? <laughs> so, so you, I, you talk about helping women take back their sass. Talk a little bit more about that. What, can you give us some examples? Certainly. I think our kindergartner and kindergarten teachers admonishment to color inside the lines kind of has guided a lot of our life choices. <laughs> and, and so we have followed the rules and done what was expected. And, you know, and, and so, and we continue that we're still 911 on our adult children's cell phones. I am, I, 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 I am, I, I'm not very good with boundaries. Um, we've been caregivers to, um, uh, sometimes three generations, sometimes simultaneously. <laughs> and we have this pathological propensity to please. We want, you know, we want to be popular with our kids and we want our grandchildren. We just, so after a while that kind of can zap your sass. And I, I tell very candid stories, um, in my book about, I, how I do that with my own children. I, I still do. I mean, writing this book, I, I, I don't know if I say this in the book, but writing the book, I was easily derailed. If that phone would ring or FaceTime, I would just drop every, I've been in doctor's offices and slipped out to take that precious phone call. Not regretting it, mind you, but it does tend to postpone ourselves. Mm -hmm. and our passions and things we may want to do for ourselves. And so I, I think, you know, I think it zaps our sass and, and look at how the God, the way they refer to 
age, you know, uh, what are some of the, um, the twilight years, uh, third, you know, third chapter, all those awful references. So in the book, I say, let's call it uh, BBLB years, be brave, lose the baby years. And so I, I started using that. It's like, say it, say let's, it again, let's, please. What, what is it? BBLB, which stands for Be Brave, Lose the Beige. It's, that's a mouthful. So your BBLB years um, is how I've shortened it. Because BBLB says, um, says it's fun and sassy and pokes fun at societal roles. And it says yes when everything around us keeps saying no. I mean, my, my son has actually taken a sharp knife from my hand when I've been cutting up salad stuff at their house. Mom! you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> it's like, I have used a knife for 50 years or, you know, but they, I mean, so the way people, you know, I, I had a biking accident and uh, they wanted to wrap me in bubble wrap afterwards. And I remember walking through a Starbucks. Now I looked like a mummy because I had my leg and a brace and a, and a broken arm and people look with such sympathy. But if I had been, you know, 46 instead of 66, I think they would have looked at like, hey, right on. I'm sure you'll be back on that bike in no time. But 66, mm-hmm. See, we almost have to reinvent our own version of athleticism because mm-hmm. you just look at all the eight. I mean, I was listening to an earlier podcast of yours where you talked about ageism and it's alive and well. I'm really curious about um, breaking the rules because uh, many of us in the baby boomer generation, that's what we did. We broke the rules um, with a fair amount of sass. And then (laughs) um, (laughs) life happens and we become professionals and we learn how to to work within color within the lines again. And so I, I appreciate your bringing this back, saying reclaim it because we 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 know how to do it. Well, that's well. I mean, look at the 60s, flower yeah. power, all of, all of that. Well, you know, um, I think breaking rules is different than breaking laws. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. And uh, I, I tell this, I tell stories in my um, in my book about it's it's it's, nothing, it's baby things, silly little things that you th- that really shouldn't even be noticed. It could, might not even be noticed. And my, one of mine, which I write about is called my three drink strategy. And so, somehow over the years, at not, you know, if I go out to dinner, I, I end up with like three drinks in front of me. Um, and I have a glass of iced tea. I might have some water. I'll have a glass of wine. And so pe- my family and friends have started, started noticing this. My gosh, Hydration, caffeination, and inebriation, the perfect triangle. <laughs> <laughs> and then people started, I mean, my my friends will rush to order for me. It's like, and I thought I was kind of invisible by doing some of these things. It's just, but it's out something that little can actually be inspiring. My daughter-in-law said, I didn't even know you were allowed to order more than one drink. So very, very tiny baby steps can be empowering, can put you back into control mm-hmm. at a time when, you know, we, we health issues, money issues, the loss of a partner, you, there's a lot we can't control. Right. So when we can right. control those little tiny things, do it. You talk about 35 maxims in your book that help people take back their sense. So you want to share <laughs> with us? Sure. Those, those kind of, I don't know, they just kind of threaded their way through my book and uh, making a point, I guess. Uh, and so I, I actually printed some out. I, I'd be happy to read. There, there are 35 of them. Um, there are anything from, yes, your children's shit really does stink <laughs> or allow, <laughs> which I mean, I, uh, my, well, my family has been raised Jewish. And so it, there was this, you know, my mother used to say, yes, but your shit really does stink. And so I used to say, David, 
your your poop really does stink. And this is my son. And he would say, no, mom, no, mom. And my body odor smells like roses. I mean, so it became this family joke. But but the way we treat and think about our children, you wouldn't think we would think that. Another one is allow comfort to govern your fashion choices. Another is acceptance is a is an active state, not a passive state. Mm. Bravery is about saying yes and. Um, so these are kind of threaded throughout. Um, uh, don't let time be your boss. Uh, I have a whole ch- chapter on time and transitions and this kind of sibling rivalry that goes on between brother time and sister space and that war. And especially as we all get older, those questions haunt us. You know, how much time do I have left? And what do I do with this time? And uh, uh, I'm a big fan of a theologian whose name is Richard Rohr. And he runs the Center for Action and Contemplation in in, uh, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he talks a lot about the second half of life. I mean, I, he's not the only one to do that, but um, and finding meaning in the second half of your life and how the first half is it's the ba- it's the the survival things. You're you know having children and perpetuating yourself and making money and paying a mortgage, and you're competitive and your ego is usually front and center at that time. And but in the second half of your life. You don't have to do those things. And so this book is really for the second half of your life Mm -hmm. and what you're going to do with it. And I I have found that people who have done a better job of balance in the first half of their life seem to have an easier transition in the second half of life. I know Mm -hmm. way too many men who retire and don't know what to do with themselves Mm -hmm. because they spent all that time defining themselves by their work. And I think women really just have a tendency to be a little more proficient at that. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And, and, yeah. And how do you, how do you, how are you proficient at that? What, what is it that you do to balance your life? Well, my husband and I have always said, my second husband, by the way, I also have a, a sub chapter in my book called Dump the Dude, which I did with my first husband, who's a nice guy, but still, oh. he's no longer with me. Um, we, we, we tried to take our retirement a little bit at a time. You said we were, mar- we are, we have a market research firm. And so I've collected data and all this good stuff on women my age. And so that's, that. that those statistics, some of those statistics found their way into the book. Um, but so when we could, we took time off. We did travel. Um, we were able to go because it was our own business. You know, there were summers when I brought a basket, I had a basketball hoop at our office and mm-hmm. brought my, my kids there and they were at our office. And so that, I mean, while I don't have a pension from, from a work, I, I had control over, you know, living even in the first half. And so now it just seems like a natural extension to go and write a book or teach. I don't want to, I don't want to fully retire. I, I mean, what, what, what would we do? It's just like you guys found, you know, found that your uh, podcast, you're helping other women. Mm-hmm. I doubt if there is many men <laughs> listening to your broadcasts. I'm sure there aren't any men reading my book, but if we can help other women, then that's just a wonderful thing. That does provide meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think purpose is everything. That just doesn't go away. Right. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Many of the things that you have said resonate with me particularly well. (laughs) And um, so- How is that? Is there anything else that you would like our listeners to our watchers, our, our viewers to, to to know about you, Liz, or about how you think about life? How do you think about aging? I don't dwell on it. Um, 
I, it's happening. <laughs> you think you, if you just stand in front of a microwave waiting for your cup of tea to, to get hot enough, you see those seconds peeling away and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> time. So I try, I don't really dwell on it. I just want to live. And I, you know, I, I probably, if, if there is, if there is sin in the world, it's like wasting a day. Um, <laughs> Even though a good waste of day, I, I recommend, like, you know, pondering a blade of grass or something. But um, I just don't want to, you know, dwell on my bad knees <laughs> and whether or not well, our, our finances will last until I'm 95 and <laughs> you just keep living. So dwelling on that or getting mad at Google for the way they depict women that are our are our age um, doesn't really do me a lot of good. Mm -hmm. You're doing the good by doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Yes. And, and as are you both, as are you're giving people a voice. Um, I'll never, I think it was your podcast where I, Listen to, and I don't remember the woman's name now, but she did the genes for older women, maybe. Yes. yes. Uh huh. Diane. And I loved that. <laughs> that was the coolest. That was just the coolest interview. Um, she and, and she had like a business on a home shopping network of some sort or something, and then had the courage to lead, leave that to go do something else she wanted. And that's where the bravery comes in. It, and it's not climbing a mountain. It's choosing to a different mm -hmm. path. Right. You know, even one where you're very successful, but it's just like, no, this isn't working for me anymore. And that's brave. Mm -hmm. And you just really have to admire people who who have that kind of courage instead of just climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Who, who's, <laughs> it does that, but okay. <laughs> great for you <laughs> what's it doing for the world as a whole <laughs> well thanks to diana i'm wearing jeans for the first time in 20 years so. oh mm -hmm. you know i need to go back and listen to it and find out where she where they're sold mm -hmm. because yeah. <laughs> they're great <laughs> who can wear jeans they're too confining <laughs> so that was a that was kind of an excitement so so you're bringing those messages you're doing the work, ladies. You're doing it. <laughs> Thank you. And I really, I, for one, appreciate it because uh, these messages get really lost. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz. A pleasure Thank to you. have you on our show. It, yeah, it's been wonderful. And listeners, thank you for your loyalty. Because of you, our numbers are growing all across the country and overseas. And, you know, this is a good thing. Still, we need more subscribers and reviews on Apple Play and YouTube. So support women over 70 and let your voice be heard and help us change the conversation about women aging. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 <laughs>